Our next speaker is Dr. Jessica Theodore. She's a paleontologist at U University of Calgary. And uh, well, she started her career early. She found her first fossil when she was six. She has uh, parents that were uh, had a lot of uh, paleontologist and biologist friends, and they encouraged her. She took her fossil to the Royal Ontario Museum, and they identified it for her. It was a sea lily, uh, the stem of a sea lily. And with more encouragement, she took some courses there for kids. And it sounds like she never really looked back. She was a paleontologist sort of from then on. She uh, was an intern later at the museum and got her BSc at U of T also. And not a BA, but a BSc. And I got that one right. And later, a PhD at UC Berkeley. She's also worked at Brown and UCLA. She was a curator at the Illinois State Museum, where apparently at the opening, uh, it was attended. She was there at the opening of the, the, new exhibit. the new exhibit. And a young senator named Obama was there, too. Apparently, he went on to do other things. She was recently interviewed on our national science show, Crooks and Quarks, which is pretty awesome. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Theodore, who's going to tell us about this. Thank you very much. So I'm going to focus mostly on what we know now about the origin of whales. And I'm going to give you the slant of it that Darwin didn't know very much about whales. Um, and this might shock you because Darwin knows a lot about a lot of things. But although Darwin observed whales, not very much was known about them during his time, apart from whaling lore. These are narwhals, um, and they're really fascinating. There's a lot about their behavior we don't understand. But Darwin didn't know very much about whales or the fossil record of whales. Darwin, in fact, speculates on the origin of whales in The Origin of Species, and it didn't last long. It's a paragraph that was excised in all subsequent editions because it elicited so much mockery. Okay? Darwin saw whales, and what he knew of whales, he knew they were mammals. That had been established in 1693 by John Ray in his publication, The Vestiges of Creation. So it was recognized as early as the late 1600s that whales were not fishes, they were mammals. Okay? Darwin knew of whales, he'd certainly seen them in whaling, but there was no, almost no, there was a little, but not almost no fossil record of whales. And Darwin suggests in the origin that whales might have evolved from bears. And his suggestion, all that Darwin says about whale origins is this, that in North America the black bear was seen by Hearn swimming for hours with a widely open mouth, thus catching almost like a whale insects in the water. Even in so extreme a case as this, if the supply of insects were constant and if better adapted competitors did not already exist in the country, I can see no difficulty in a race of bears being rendered by natural selection more and more aquatic in their structure and habits <coughs> with larger and larger mouths till a creature was produced as monstrous as a whale. Now, there's a lot of problems with that as a scenario. And Darwin was quite rightly attacked for this kind of speculative idea with no evidence behind it. <coughs> Darwin was pretty clearly comparing this experience of a naturalist in North America observing a bear catching insects kind of by the by with its mouth open and comparing it with what baleen whales do, which is a very specialized form of feeding that isn't common to many whale species. It was common to almost all the whales that were hunted for whaling, for whale oil which is why Darwin would have focused on it. But it ignores the fact that the vast majority of whales actually don't feed that way. Whales have presented a problem to biologists for a very long time. This is the Curvier's Hall of Natural History in Paris. And if you're ever in Paris, do not skip it. It's awesome. This display was designed by Georges Cuvier and has never been allowed to be changed <coughs> since. This is the ori original exhibit. And in fact, although you can't see them in this view, over here and over here, there are the pair of giraffes that Napoleon had brought back to Paris from Egypt. These are all whale skeletons. And you can see there's a tremendous amount of diversity, and these animals are highly adapted to aquatic life. They no longer have hind limbs. You can see there's nothing there. 
They have greatly adapted heads. Their forelimbs are strongly adapted into flippers. They cannot survive in a terrestrial environment. This is the heart of the problem that Darwin faced in trying to understand them, and in fact the heart of the problem that everybody faced in trying to understand the evolution of whales. George Gaylord Simpson, a very, very prominent paleontologist in 1945, said this, because of their perfected adaptation to a completely aquatic environment, aquatic life, with all its attendant conditions of respiration, circulation, dentition, that's their teeth, locomotion, etc., the cetaceans are on the whole the most peculiar and aberrant of mammals. Their place in the sequence of cohorts and orders is open to question and is indeed quite impossible to determine in any purely objective way. So even as recently as 1945, the most prominent vertebrate paleontologist and mammologist and evolutionary biologist of his day looked at whales and threw up his hands and said, I give, I can't figure out where they come from. Honestly. So, after John Ray figured out that they were mammals, there's kind of a lull in, understand, in the evidence for whale origins for a long time. The understanding that whales were mammals was important, but there wasn't any fossil record until this publication, Harlan, 1834, and this is the first described fossil remains of any whale. Exciting, isn't it? <laughs> they were in fact originally described as marine reptiles. The name Basilosaurus for this species, or this genus of whales, actually means king lizard. So these were thought to be reptile remains. Fairly quickly, they were toured, as in the Victorian way, as the remains of a giant sea serpent. This is from 1845. It was already established at this point by this man, Richard Owen, from the British Museum, who's often regarded as some kind of foe of Darwin's, but was probably the most single most prominent anatomist and paleontologist in, certainly in Britain, and one of the most preeminent in the world. Owen established very quickly, in a couple of years after Harlan's publication, that those remains were not remains of a reptile, they were in fact remains of a primitive whale. That's not, that's not a whale there, he's holding, that's actually a crocodile. Okay. Owen noticed that these remains, although he was pretty positive that they were from a whale, it was very definitely nothing like any of the modern whales. Its teeth were nothing like any of the modern toothed whales and certainly nothing like any of the baleen whales because they don't have any teeth. This is the skull of Basilosaurus. Um, this is a subsequent specimen, much better shape than the original material. <clears throat> and you can see its teeth don't look anything like what you can think of. How many of you have ever seen a skull of a toothed whale, say an orca or a dolphin? They all have little peg-like teeth, right? Nothing like this. These are strongly serrated triangles. And modern tooth whales, all their teeth are the same. They're what we call homodont. They don't have different teeth at the front of the mouth and the hind of the mouth, the way you do. This animal certainly does. Its molars are very different from its incisors. So it became clear to Owen and to others that in the fossil record, there were whales that were very clearly whales but that were not like anything extant among the whales. This man was Owen's successor at the British Museum. His name is Sir William Henry Flower. He's not a very well known in the public lexicon of science, but he was an excellent anatomist. And although others, both before and after him, suggested that whales might be closely related to horses, or to manatees, or to, um, oh, let's see, who else? Possibly independently derived from marine reptiles, possibly marsupials, um, possibly seals, and possibly armadillos and anteaters. How all have been suggested as possible ancestors or rel close relatives of whales. In fact, Flower actually 
as it turns out, nailed it. Flower noted that in many languages, whales were termed sea pigs, sea hawk. A lot of the, the older names in a lot of European languages, that's what they translate to. And further he noticed that there were a number of anatomical similarities between whales and hoofed mammals, particularly the even-toed hoofed mammals. I'll show you who they are in a minute. He noted similarities in the structure of the penis and the way it erects in these animals. He noticed similarities in the gut. He noticed other similarities all in the soft tissue, not in the bony tissue, between whales and the even-toed hoofed ungulates. Now, I'm going to be showing you a lot of what are called cladograms, which are, in a sense, family trees. Many people look at these and try to read them this way, as a lineal <coughs> chain of ancestors and descendants. That is actually not an evolutionary tree, and it's not an evolutionary way of thinking. That is a much older idea in history known as the great chain of being. And unfortunately for us, a lot of people have grafted the great chain of being idea onto evolution and thinking that evolution means that fish somehow transform into salamanders and they transform into reptiles and they transform into mammals and then mammals into humans. And that's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is this kind of family tree where populations give rise to descendant populations which give rise to descendant populations, okay? You are not the only member of your generation. You have siblings, most of you will. Your, you and your siblings are descended from your parents. Your parents are descended from your grandparents and gave rise to cousins of yours, and so on. And so similarly, fishes and amphibians and mammals have common ancestors. But that common ancestor was not what we would necessarily call a fish, or a salamander, or a mammal. Okay? It was a common ancestor. These are nested sets. And that's a key, key point. When you read these diagrams, do not read them as lineal. They're populations. Okay? Now, in the 50s and 60s, People started worrying about where whales come from, and this paper is from Van Phelan, and I think this is from the late 60s, and it suggests that all of the ungulates here come from a group loosely called the condylarthra. That's, we now know that's not actually a group, it's an assemblage of groups. They're not all closely related. And here's our artiodactyls, that's the even-toed hoof mammals, and, does he even put whales on here? Oh, there. So he's got them sort of close to the even-toed hoofed mammals, but in this cloud of things descended from condylarths. That's because we didn't have, even then, that much fossil record. Following out of Van Valen's suggestion, and based on the limited fossil record we had of whales at the time, the suggestion came up that whales were probably descended from this group of Condylarths called the Mesonychids. And Mesonychids are interesting because they actually are even toed. They're ungulates, they're hoofed mammals, but they're carnivorous. This is what they look like skeletally. So, in body form, kind of in the back, like a hoofed mammal, long legs a little bit more adapted for running than many other mammals, but a big head with big bone-crunching kind of teeth. And their hind feet look remarkably actually like even-toed hoof mammals. They have four toes and they have a nice line of symmetry right down the middle. When we talk about ungulates, about hoof mammals, the difference between horses and cattle, you've probably heard, horses are what we call odd-toed ungulates. They have one toe. Rhinos have three, also odd-toed. The artiodactyls, and the even toes, have what biblically gets referred to as cloven hooves, right? They have an even number of toes, either four in the case of pigs and hippos, 
or two in the case of most things like cattle. And around that time, actually, there was a little bit of, in the 50s, there was a little bit of biochemical evidence that was starting to indicate that whales and artiodactyls, the even toed hoofed mammals, might be related. Most paleontologists ignored it. That probably wasn't so smart. Um, and continued to argue this side of this diagram that whales, like the blue whale and the dolphin, were related to these fossil whales that we knew, like Basilosaurus and Remingtonocetus, which I'll give you a little more detail on in a minute, and a new form called Angulocetus, and the very early Pachycetus. So all these fossil whales which were relatively poorly known, were more closely related to the mesonychids that I just showed you, these carnivorous ungulates, than to other groups of ungulates, but their most close relative was argued to be the artiodactyls, the even-toed hoofed mammals. That's kind of where I come into it, because I actually work on the even-toed hoofed mammals. That's my, my area of interest is actually terrestrial ungulates. And then the molecular data came out People started doing DNA analysis in the 80s and 90s and comparing DNA sequences for all of these animals, and their answers came up really different. Okay. Their arguments were that modern whales and dolphins were most closely related to hippos in the artiodactyls. Now, they couldn't sample DNA for the mesonychids because they're all extinct. So the paleontologists and I freely admit, having been wrong and having made this mistake, went, oh, there must be something wrong with the molecules because they can't sample these guys. That wasn't so smart either. Turns out that the molecular evidence indicating the close relationship between hippos and whales is very, very strong. It's not just one DNA sequence. It's not even just two DNA sequences. It's almost all of the DNA sequences, including a kind that's very, very hard to get wrong. These are evidence called retroposons. They're basically little bits of DNA that get inserted into your DNA that you didn't make. A lot of them are viral in origin. They get inserted into the genome, and they don't get cut out. They get copied endlessly but they don't actually do anything in you. They're just kind of sitting there. But the thing is, they get inserted in a specific place in your genome, and then all your descendants will have that same sequence in the same spot in your DNA. So if your grandfather got one of these, you will all have them. And anybody who's descended from your great-grandfather who isn't descended from your grandfather won't. Does that make sense? So. These were kind of the death knell to the idea that the molecular biologists had it wrong. Because, and you may not be able to see this, here are all the whales. These are different positions in the DNA. Um, and evidence of some of these retroposons, these little chunks of DNA. And what's interesting is that hippos share a lot of these markers with whales when nobody else does. And many other artiodactyls actually also share some of them with whales. So this indicates that these groups of animals are very closely related. Now, traditionally, hippos, they have four toes. Their tooth morphology is in line with what we see in the other even type of mammals. We've always thought they were artiodactyls since, well, after Linnaeus, but pretty much everybody since has thought they were artiodactyls. Okay? Artiodactyls is a big group of mammals. You may not have thought about this or heard the name, but you've, all of you except the vegetarians will have eaten them. I often tell my students that I work on the tasty critters. <laughs> <laughs> because this clade includes pigs, it includes peccaries, it includes camels, it includes mouse deer, it includes giraffes, it includes pronghorn, it includes Okapi, the other living giraffe species. Deer, including <laughs> moose. Antelope, that's a talkin, which is the goat clade, but also includes all the cattle. But they're all, and it's a very diverse group of animals with a very long fossil record. This is the first artiodactyl. This is a reconstruction 
of an environment in Wyoming in the Bighorn Basin from about 53 million years ago. The, all of the artiodactyls that we know today, we think are descended from something very like Diacodexus. Diacodexus looks very much like a mouse deer in many ways. It would have been different in some ways, but it's a very small animal. Even though today this group includes animals as big as hippos and giraffes, they all seem to have descended from forms that are not much more than 500 grams to a kilo in body mass. So they're basically bunny-sized and really cute. Mm -hmm. All right. So the oldest whale in the record now is even more primitive than Basilosaurus. Basilosaurus looks something like this. Okay, so this was the only whale that was known in Darwin's time. And all that was known in Darwin's time was some little bits of the front of the snout. So there really wasn't much known about fossil whales when Darwin was alive. There's the rest of the body. There's the forelimb. It's pretty paddle adapted. There's not much sign of the hind limb. For a very long time, we didn't know anything about a hind limb. And it's pretty fully aquatically adapted. You can start to see in the backbone some of the changes in the tail that indicate it had flukes. Okay? It still has teeth that are very different from modern whales. But in terms of its body, that animal is not walking on land. <coughs> Thank you, pardon. I'm getting over a cold. More recent finds. <coughs> Beginning in the 90s indicate that the oldest fossil whales we have <coughs> look something like this. And you can kind of see, this is a reconstruction, but it's based on some pretty good skeletal material. And you can see why people might have argued that it might be closely related to mesonychids rather than cardiodactyls. <coughs> the skeleton, this animal is actually quite a bit bigger than most of the, the ungulates that were around at the time it was alive in the early Eocene. This animal would have been skulls about that long. Artiodactyl skull at the same time is about this long. It has big triangular teeth. It has long legs, admittedly, with four toes, but otherwise it looks more like the carnivorous kind of ungulate than anything we saw in the even toed hoof panels. So, around the same time, in the early, in the late 90s, early 2000s, actually early 90s, the hind limb of Basilosaurus turned up. It's actually really tiny, which is why nobody had ever found it before. I'll show you in a second just how small it is. What was interesting to us was what we were trying to find out from it was what was the ankle morphology like. Because it was being argued that whales were closely related to artiodactyls, Artiodactyls have a very distinctive ankle joint. I'll show you in a little bit, and we wanted to see what it looked like. I don't know if you can see this, but all the ankle bones here in Basilosaurus are kind of fused together, which reinforces the idea that this animal wasn't walking on this hind limb. And in fact, when you see the size, this is another animal called Dorodon, but it's very similar to Basilosaurus. There is the forelimb, nice big forelimb. That's the shoulder blade there. There's the humerus. And the paddle, the radius and ulna, here's the hind limb. It's dinky. That animal is not walking on that. At best, it might have been able to grab another individual in, during copulation with that. It's really not using it for locomotion. So, when we start to look at the features of whales that make them whales, there's a number of things we look at. We look, the teeth are all in line. There's no curve around the front of the jaw. They're basically two lines of teeth. We can see that the molars actually kind of fit together. There's a groove at the back of the molar called the reentrant groove. So the molar teeth actually fit together like this. Like they're in a peg in the socket at the back. And we can see there's a big process here at the back of the ear, and the auditory bulla for hearing 
changes pretty radically. And that's important for whales because hearing in the water is really different from hearing in air. You all know it sounds really funny when you're underwater, right? It's because your ear is optimized for a lot, much less dense fluid than water. Sound travels very differently in air than it does in water. And whales don't actually hear through a bulla filled with air the way you do. Your auditory bulla is actually full of air. Whales hear through their bone. And so the auditory bulla basically fills up with bone, and that's what we call pachyo-osteosclerotic, which is a fancy word for dense, bony bulla. And whales also get this very narrow region between the brain and the front of the face. This really narrow post-orbital region of the skull. They also start to change their tooth replacement patterns. So eventually, even all the toothed whales that are alive today, they don't have any adult molars. There's nothing that you could call an adult molar in a modern tooth whale. They have a lot of basically baby teeth. Whereas these fossil whales like Dorodon, they're starting to lose, these are the adult molars, but they still have some tooth replacement going on. This is a reconstruction of what Dorodon looks like. Um, and you can see those teeth on display, and it's pretty clear that these early whales were going after fish. They were not, they weren't filter feeding the way big baleen whales do today. That's a very derived strategy. Another of the important fossil specimens that was found is this one. The black means we haven't found the bones. The shaded areas are parts where we have. And it's really interesting because the skull indicates very clearly that it's a whale. It's got the same tooth shape as Basilosaurus and Dorodon, but it's much more primitive. Look at the legs. It's got full forelimbs and hind limbs. It's actually got really big feet. Right? This animal, it's pretty clear. We've looked at the stable isotopes of the bones, so we can tell from the oxygen isotopes in the bone what kind of water these were living in. And we can tell from the carbon isotopes in the bone and teeth what kind of things they were eating. And they were very clearly eating fish, and they were living in fresh water, not the ocean. They were not terrestrial. They weren't consuming terrestrial food. It has a different isotopic signature. And these big feet pretty clearly indicate it wasn't swimming the way modern whales swim. And that caused a lot of consternation, a lot of confusion among paleontologists who were wondering, how did that work? And as best we can figure out, these guys are doing something akin to what otters do in locomotion. They're using their feet to propel them through the water. And the tail is evolving probably evolves later into a fluke system and they lose the hind limb completely. But that's much later in whale evolution than this, what we see in Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus was living in fresh water and was much more in a sense like an otter except a really, really big one because the skull's this big. Okay, this is a big animal. And then, in 2001, there was a really earth-shattering discovery for paleontologists that really knocked the Mesonican hypothesis completely out of contention for most paleontologists. This specimen, it looks kind of ugly, doesn't it? Most of the material, important early whale material, is coming from India and Pakistan. And some of it's less well-preserved than others. But this specimen's really, really important. Now let me walk you through this because you've probably never seen a skeleton that looked like this before. This is how they look before we clean them up in the lab. Okay? This is fresh out of the field in the jacket. And the reason that this picture was published was to show the orientation of each part of the bones that they were well associated with one another. So here is a limb. There. So that is the proximal limb. That's the ulna. That's the humerus. There's the hand. There's part of the other hand. And here's the hind leg and the foot back here. And the important point of having that articulated was to prove that all these pieces actually went together. 
The reconstruction of the whole animal looks like that. Notice that like Ambulocetus, this animal still has big, long hands and feet. They're reconstructed as webbed, just because most aquatic mammals that use their feet to move have webbed toes, but you could argue about it. Same kind of triangular teeth we've seen in others. Notice where are the nostrils? They're here. They're not up here at the front of the snow anymore. In previous, in earlier more basal fossil whales, it's way out here at the tip. This is a little further up. That indicates a little bit more aquatic adaptation. But the really important point of this specimen was here's the, the diagram reconstructing the hind leg and what went on in the hind leg. But the really critical point of these feet was here in the ankle. You remember I said that artiodactyls have a really specialized ankle joint? Your ankle joint works mostly like any other mammals on the planet. Okay? In your ankle, you have a bone that anthropologists call the talus and that most mammal workers would call the astragalus. It doesn't matter, it's the same bone. And it sits at the bottom of the foot and your heel kind of sticks out from behind it and it sits there and it's kind of shaped like a cylinder. And your tibia, your shin bone, comes, articulates on top of it. When you walk, your shin rotates over the top of that cylinder in your leg, right? So your leg rotates over that bone. That's what I'm doing with my right leg right now. Okay, that's how most mammals, astragalus works. Artiodactyls have done something really funky with theirs, and it's always been considered to be the defining feature of them, that on theirs, not only is there, you can see, there's that proximal cylinder, that cylinder at the top of the bone, that the rest of the foot would have rotated over. What artiodactyls do that's unique is they have another one at the bottom, so that the bottom of the foot can rotate the same way. You can't do that with your foot, can you? You can't rotate your foot like that over your ankle joint. You can do it a little bit, but not all the way back. Any cow, pig, hippo can do that. That's part of their genetic legacy is that funky ankle joint. We have a long name for it, the double trochleated astragalus. What was really, really mind-boggling was to find this fossil whale that has this same hand joint. That's what put the nail in the coffin of the Mesonicid idea for most people, because here is a normal looking mammal astragalus or talus, and that's from a Mesonicid. This is what that same bone looks like in a pig. So instead of having just a proximal pulley here and having kind of a flat surface, it has a pulley on the distal surface, on the surface the foot rotates on. This is what we see in diapodexis in artiodactyls. And here's the comparison. Here's an artiodactyl, the, most, the earliest one in the fossil record. Here's the same bone in that fossil whale and the same bone in a mesonychid. So this indicated to most paleontologists that pretty clearly mesonychids laid outside of a grouping of whales and artiodactyls. And the only question open is where do whales fit within artiodactyls or are they the sister group of, the next group over, the closest cousins to artiodactyls. This is the reconstruction of Rhodocetus. And you can see that, <coughs> excuse me, it's similar to Ambulocetus. It's much better preserved. We know a lot more of its material. <coughs> and unlike Ambulocetus, this animal's forelimb is already shortened a little bit. Ambulocetus's hind limb and forelimb are pretty close to the same size. It has big hind feet, but also relatively big forefeet. In Rhodocetus, it's got a reduced forelimb, and the hand is a little shorter. The feet are huge still. The hind limb is still well developed, and it's got a complete pelvis that articulates slightly with the back fold, but not fully. It's not tightly connected to the backbone the way yours is or any quadrupedal terrestrial mammal is. It's loosened up that joint a bit because it's not bearing as much weight on it most of the time. 
There's a reconstruction of Rhodocetus eating a poor hapless artidactyl contemporary. This is Thoradon, one of those basal whales. And notice that by this time, we have a really reduced hind limb. The forelimb has stayed relatively similar in size, become more paddle-shaped, but that hind limb's almost gone now. And we have a lot of other species that fit in between here that I'm not going to go into nauseating detail, giving you fossil after fossil after fossil, showing all the variations, but there are quite a number. In addition to the trends that we see in limb reduction, in elaboration of the flukes, now the flukes don't preserve, but we see changes in the vertebrae in the backbone that indicate they're present. We also see migration of the nostrils to the top of the skull to form a blowhole which causes huge changes in the skulls of whales, and why, if any of you have ever looked at the skull of a whale, it'll confuse you if you know anything about mammal skull anatomy. Because essentially what's happened is that nares that should be out at the tip of the snout has migrated up the head, and all the bones around it have gone with it, like that, to the top of the head. One other spectacular fossil I do want to show you that documents a little bit of the transition is this animal, which is Myocetus. This animal is another early whale. You can see the teeth here. It still has differentiated teeth. And that's the adult in red. And in blue is a fetus, preserved within the maternal body cavity. We're pretty sure that it is a fetus and not something it ate, for a number of reasons, one of which is the tooth morphology. The other is the position. And what's interesting about this is how do how do babies present themselves in most mammals? Head first or feet first? Yes. Head first. How about whales? Anybody know? Fluke first. Fluke first. Yeah. You don't want to be born with a face full of water. Right? For an air-breathing mammal, that's a bad idea. Modern whales are all born fluke first. Myocetus is a completely obligately aquatic animal. It has no hind limbs. It has a nice paddle-like forelimb. And it has a head first facing fetus. So before the evolution of rear presentation in whales. Now, the most recent development, I would say, is we finally figured out, we think, who the actual closest relative among artiodactyls to the whales is. And it's this animal, Indohyus. This animal made a big splash when it came out in the media about, oh, 2007. We'd known about Indohyus for a long time. It's a member of a rather obscure group of Eocene artiodactyls called the Rauelids. But they were only known from teeth forever. Like, in all of my entire graduate career, the only specimens I ever saw of this thing were a couple of little teeth. And then Hans Tavison found a skeleton of the whole animal. And this animal is really interesting, and it causes some really interesting features. Now, you notice. Where is this being presented as being? In water. And it turns out this animal is really interesting. For one, although it's very clearly an artiodactyl, it shares with fossil whales a really funky feature of the ear. Whales have a really thick lip of the tympanic wall of inside the ear that's related to the thickening and filling of the ear so that they can hear in water. It's known as the involucrum. And it's thought to have evolved in part because of evolving to adapt to hear underwater. This is what it looks like in Pachycetus in this fossil one. So it's this thick curved edge of this wall of the tympanic cavity. And here it is in a modern dolphin, same thing here on the side of the middle ear cavity. And here it is in Indohyus, same thing. Not at all like what we see in other more terrestrial artiodactyls. Indohyus, we now know, based on this skeleton, has a number of interesting features. One, it has really heavy, thickened bones, like it needs ballast. It's a small animal. It's only about this big. It's not a large animal. Its tooth morphology is also not at all like whales. It's not triangular serrated teeth. It's square, cuspy, artiodactyl kind of teeth. Ungulate, 
herbivore kind of teeth. And when we've done isotope tests on it, its diet shows up as being terrestrial plants, which is interesting. But its oxygen isotopes show that it was spending a lot of time in the water, in fresh water. So our ideas about this transition that whales make into the water this seems to indicate that these and whales are closely, very closely related. And so what seems to be going on is that whales first enter the water probably to hide. Not to feed, but to hide. Mouse deer still do that, actually. And hippos spend a lot of time in the water, but they don't feed in the water either. Anybody know where hippos feed? Or what they eat? They eat grass, and they'll go up to 10 clicks terrestrially every night to eat it. So they spend all day in the water to keep cool, and they go up on land, and they go as far as 10 kilometers away to eat grass. That's probably not dissimilar to what something like Indohias was doing. Subsequently, almost certainly, something not that different from what Darwin outlines happened. They started to catch some protein along with the grasses they were eating in the edges of the water, they probably moved from the terrestrial margins of the water into the swampy vegetation, start catching some protein. Protein is a very good source of nutrients compared to what you have to do to process plants. And if there's more protein, it becomes very easy to switch diet. These phylogenies, this is the one that Hans Tavison published. And he still, at the time, was arguing that whales and Indohias were sister taxa and they were closely related to, but separate from, all the other artiodactyls, including the hippos. A colleague of mine and I took his data and reanalyzed it, adding in the molecular data, and we think this is the better answer. If you combine the morphological data and the molecular data, what you get as an answer is that hippos and Indohias and its relatives are the closest relatives of cetaceans, and that basically gives you a group of animals that have evolved some variation on aquatic habitat occupation through the whole clade. And they're deeply nested within the Artiodactyla, and the Mesonychids are actually way outside, way away from where we used to think they belonged. So in a sense, Darwin wasn't wrong. He just didn't know enough. And most of what we know, documenting whale origins, has been assembled in the last 30 years. There's a lot more to find. Unfortunately, a lot of it may not be found until the regime in Pakistan changes a bit. But that's really ultimately what's happening. So although Darwin got the lineage wrong, it certainly wasn't theirs. His transition isn't that goofy. And possibly, I hope to think that he would have been comforted by that. <laughs> I'm happy to, in I have lots more slides. I can talk a lot more. But I thought I'd stop and open it up for questions at this point. Thank you. That was great. And the crocodile, where does that enter? The crocodile? And the alligator. Those are completely unrelated. They're actually reptiles. They're more closely related to birds and, and dinosaurs than to mammals. Yeah? And the deposit of something you said, what proportion of human beings have that? Oh, retroposons? Yeah. Oh. You'd be surprised how much of your DNA actually doesn't do anything for you um, that we know of. There's quite a lot of your genome that is um, taken up with retroposons. I'd have to go and look up the actual number for humans, but it's a surprisingly high percentage of the genome. You'd be shocked. Yeah? Can, can you indicate any impact these retroposons have on human health? Um, there doesn't seem to be any that we know of yet. Any biological advantages? Again, not that we know of yet, but they've only been known and talked about for the last 15 years or so. Yeah. So our understanding of them is still pretty limited. I might have something to add to that. It turns out that they're now discovering that a lot of this so-called junk DNA is in fact DNA from outside sources, such as viruses and other, um, and other sort of invasive uh, agents 
that invade the cell and use the cell's own mechanisms uh, to replicate. Yeah. If this happens in the sexual organs, then obviously any sperm or eggs that are made of this include this material. But since it's not required for human uh, usage itself, it often ends up being unused. Well, that's the thing is it's not transcribed. Mm -hmm. So DNA exists. It's a code. It doesn't do anything on its own until it's transcribed using into RNA and from RNA into proteins. And there are large chunks of our DNA which are not transcribed into proteins, but that actually control when RNA is transcribed into proteins and when it isn't and which ones are turned on and off. So that transcription controls, for example, if you start with a stem cell, what parts of the DNA that get transcribed and when will determine whether that's going to be a liver cell or a brain cell or it'll determine that cell's fate. These insertions into our code are just copied. They're never transcribed, as far as we can tell. And that's why we tend to think they don't have much effect for human health so far. If it's, it's possible and conceivable that they could, but so far we haven't found any evidence that they do. Yeah? Um, when those pieces of code are like, uh, copied into sex cells like that that aren't necessarily used for anything, um, in humans, could that also potentially, like in other species, be a, uh, like a source of um, where additional genetic information could be coming Potentially. From? In, it seems like in eukaryotes, that's not a very common mechanism. It is a common mechanism in prokaryotes to okay. have lateral gene transfer. So DNA is, is basically cut and pasted in by another organism into um, your DNA, and it gets used. So that's how we can make transgenic bacteria that can produce things for us, right? How many of you have heard of genetic engineering, right? Insulin is not made by harvesting human pancreases or other mammal pancreases very often anymore. It's now made by genetic engineering of bacteria by inserting the genes for making insulin into the genes of a bacterium and you letting the bacteria make it for us, okay? But that, mechanism does not seem to be part and parcel of how eukaryotes, so things with nucleated cells, do that. Um, and it doesn't seem to work very well for most eukaryotic cells without a lot of manipulation and effort, which is one of the reasons why genetic therapies have been difficult to get to work in humans. I just mean to look at, because I, I know I hear the argument a lot of the time that um, uh, each species only has so many genes that, it, yep. you know, so I'm saying, like, uh, could more genes be added to... Potentially, but we don't have any evidence that's a, that oh. that has happened. Okay. But it's potentially possible, yeah. Yes, do we have a detailed step-by-step -step sequence showing teeth to baleen? Um, actually, we do, are beginning to. We have uh, early, what are clearly relatives of modern baleen whales, ancestral baleen whales, I can show you a picture. Um, take it out. There is a fossil named Gengucetus. Let me pull up my slides for my class and I can show you Gengucetus. It's very, very cool. It has very primitive looking whale teeth. There it is. This is a new specimen from Australia and it's very, very cool. It has teeth just like a basilosaurid whale, very primitive looking whale teeth with different front teeth but it's got skull shape and other characteristics and migration of the nares that indicate that it's related to other baleen whales, the mysticete whales. And there's a subsequent animal called Lanocetus, which has both the teeth and nutrient foramina in the bone of the palate that indicate that baleen was present. We don't have any fossilized baleen. It doesn't fossilize well, but we have evidence that it was there. Yeah? Can you cite the paper? Uh, I can probably find it for oh, you. Yes. Oh, oh that, that, that's for Gangucetus, not Lanocetus. Lanocetus is a different paper, but I can probably find it for you in about five minutes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Just to get right that down to brass tacks, yeah. the science of DNA sequencing uh, that we use in courts of law to identify criminals also very nicely supports evolution. Yeah. There we go. DNA sequencing supports evolution 
pretty much across the board. And what's interesting is not where it actually conflicts with the morphological evidence. I made a lot of that today because it has been very controversial in my field. But the fact that more than nine times out of 10, it, act, it, all, it supports every evolutionary scenario that we've come up with uh, based on morphology. And in fact, the, the reality of DNA sequencing is that it almost always agrees. Where it doesn't agree with the morphological evidence, that tells you there's something cool and interesting going on. It's always nice to find the anomaly. <laughs> yeah. but, but you know, if somebody was to go to a public lecture and uh, be brought in and say that there's no evidence for evolution and be quoted in the newspaper for saying that, they would have to be. Oh, every every little bit of understanding we have of the AIDS epidemic supports evolution. Mm -hmm. um, that all sorts of epidemics. The whole issue of antibiotic resistance is an example of evolution in action. That's why the doctors all tell you you have to finish your course of antibiotics because the problem is if you don't, the chances of your having evolved a version of the bacterium that can resist that antibiotic go up. So if you were with a group who paid somebody to come and say that in public, would you ask for your money back? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's I mean it, it's lying. Yeah, that's what I was getting. Yeah. No, I mean, it, and anyone who tries to tell you that that's not true can then not accept DNA evidence in court or anything else. It's, I have occasionally had students who question the reality of radiometric dating. They say that the rates of radiometric decay could vary and haven't always been the same. And my answer to that is, okay, if you believe that, don't ever go for radiation treatment for cancer. Yeah. Because it depends on that principle. All the dosages depend on the principle of regular radiometric decay. Or not use up-to-date tuberculosis drugs. Yeah, into any of those. Tuberculosis. Yeah. Yes? Can you, you comment on a, a statement that Dr. Gingrich made in, I think, 2007 in a TV interview, or TVD? He said, um, this is in the, the Grand Evolution, the Grand Experiment video series. He said, uh, since then we have found the four limbs, the hands, and the front arms of Rhodocetus, and we understand that it doesn't have the kind of arms that can be spread out like flippers or on a whale. No, they don't. They wouldn't have, mar have worked like a modern whale's would. They're slightly more flipper-like than Ambulocetus. They pretty clearly indicate that the animal was not spending a significant amount of time weight bearing on those four feet, but they are not fully developed into a flipper the way that a modern whales are. The arm position is wrong. But if you go to the University of Michigan, you'll see a drawing of Rhodocetus, which contradicts what Ginger is saying. And the drawings are made by artists who are not the scientists and who have put their own interpretation on subconsciously when they make them. Do you them. know if those drawings at the University of Michigan are I still haven't there? seen them. I couldn't comment. Just say hence the word transition. Yes. That's why they're between this and that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Are you involved in evil evil in any particular? Yeah, actually, I am a little bit. Um, not a lot from the developmental biology perspective, perspective, but I'll show you a, a, a couple of slides that show you what's going on with this. So one of the side stories that I didn't want to get too far into is that debate has sort of among artiodactyl specialists has been okay if whales are related to hippos. And now Rowellas, where the heck? What's going on? Because hippos, so this is the part of the diagram I have to show you, and I apologize you can't read it. But this is the earliest Eocene, so this is about 55 million years ago. The oldest fossil whales are 53 and a half million years old. The oldest fossil artiodactyls are 54 and a half million years old. Very similar in age. The oldest fossil hippos are 17 million years old. That's a big honking gap in the record. We term that a ghost lineage. We're missing some of the, of the information. So the question is, what's filling that gap in the record here? And it's usually argued that hippos are closely related to this lineage here called the anthracotheres, which, as you'll notice, conveniently show up about, oh, about 50 million years ago and go extinct just around when hippos start, getting, start showing up in the record. And so that's been one of the arguments. But there's also a couple of other lineages that might be important. And one of the reasons that people argue that anthracotheres might be like hippos is because some very late anthracotheres are very hippo-like in their head morphology. And so the scenario those people present would be that within artiodactyls, anthracotheres and hippos branch off of the whales, which have branched off of the artiodactyls. Now, as it turns out, the, the evo-devo part of this is this jaw, 
belongs to an animal called Sibocuris, which is another Eocene age, so about 40 million year old lineage of artiodactyls. So far only known from Europe. And based on their adult teeth, everybody thought they were really boring standard, box standard herbivores. And then we found this jaw. And this jaw has adult molars back here, so they have little four cuffs, boring herbivore molars. And these are their baby teeth in the front. What do you think of the shape of those baby teeth? They look a lot more like whale teeth than they do like artiodactyl baby teeth. And this is what the animal itself would have looked like. So it's an even-toed hoof mammal with four toes, very much a herbivore in all of its adult morphology, but its baby teeth, these deciduous premolars, do not look like the deciduous premolars you find in other artiodactyls. They look much more like what we see in early whale deciduous premolars. So the suggestion my colleague Foss, Scott Foss and I made is that possibly these were also very closely related to the origin of whales and that the origin of whale dentition probably has basically something to do with penomorphosis or retaining juvenile features into the adult. So the earliest whale teeth have these sort of serrated triangular baby teeth and not so much in the hind molars and then as you get into Basilosaurus the molars start to look more like the baby teeth. So essentially that this tooth morphology that we see in the early whales is basically them retaining the baby teeth of something like the Sibocuris. So that's where my Evo Devo comes into it. There is more Evo Devo work being done on, on whales looking at um, an old, old series of dolphin embryos that were collected in the, I think the 18 or 1900s. Um, as you can imagine, working with marine mammal embryology is more than a little challenging. Um, you don't get a lot of opportunity to work with embryos. So what they've done is go back to these preserved slides that were made a long, long time ago and then retroactively try and test them with some of the stains that we use today. And what they figured out is what's happening in the hind limb is that the limb bud actually forms, but the cells that are sensitive to the morphogen that develops the hind limb disappear before that morphogen gets expressed, essentially. That makes sense. To me. Yeah. <laughs> so essentially the, the signaling center that, that normally would react to the protein that comes in to say, okay, build a hind limb, it dies before that protein gets expressed. And so the hind limb never actually even forms in most whales. And in a few aberrant forms that have been found with little tiny hind limbs, clearly it didn't die off completely and it responds to make a very small hind limb. So basically to put it in, to put it into colloquial terms, uh, the postman who's carrying the mail that says the foreclosure has been called off uh, doesn't manage to reach the people before they've pulled out of their house and abandoned it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, skipping out on the process server. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I'll take one more from you and that's yeah. it, okay? So what would possibly be the incentive for a well-developed, a well-adapted land mammal to decide to leave the land where there's good drinking water and an abundant food supply. It doesn't make a decision, it's not and, conscious. And go into an inhospitable water environment. It's not an inhospitable environment. It's, it's actually, for many mammals, it's like mouse deer, it's a safe refuge from predators. It's ducking into the water and using it as a refuge, and its subsequent generations are gonna keep using it as a refuge, and then they might eat a little and stay a while. It is not a conscious decision on the part of any individual. It is an, a series of accidents that are capitalized on by selection. That's all it is. And if you're trying to read into it intention, you are taking the wrong tack. Because you can even see it in terms of, for example, like the hippos. They stay in the water throughout the day so they don't get overheated. 